Yeah. Okay. So uh, yes, the last uh, subphylum we talked about was a phylum uh, crustacean. Okay. Uh, Chilo, uh, Chilo Serata. Is that right? Chilo Serata. See, oh boy, I this morning. I'm glad I'm writing everything on the board. <laughs> I'm not depending on my memory and talk about things like that. Okay, uh, subphylum crustacea, insect of the sea. Uh, the reason uh, a lot of species in this uh, subphylum, they do have a mandible mouth. But the mandibulate animals, as you know, uh, they live on land. And what other uh, phylum, I'm not asking subphylum, what other phylum we talked about in here, it could be a quiz question, that has mandible? What other phylum? I didn't say subphylum. What other phylum and the common name, give me the common name of that phylum too, that have mandible, the mouth part. Again, I'm, I'm emphasizing on mandible. Is it here? No. Where are you? Mandibles. Here we go. What other phylum? Phylum that we talked about that has mandible. Anybody? Glenn? I'm going to call you Alex. If you know. Onychophora, is that right? Velvet worm, velvet worm, common name, onychophora, phylum, 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 onychophora. I hope you're studying them. You have a quiz today. Open book, open note, open laptop, open mind. Is that right? Um, people who watch my video open say, oh my, my God, he always give open books. We should get take zoology with him, but they don't know. Yeah, yeah. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they do have one other phylum that we studied. The mouth part is onychophora. The mouth part is onychophora. And then we will study insects in a minute, right now, today, that they do have the mouth part they have is uh, they have a mandible mouth part. But anyhow, some of the most famous members of this uh, subphylum are lobsters, as you know, crayfish, shrimp, crabs, uh, barnacles, water flea. These are, uh, and we do have all of these in the lab, okay, uh, right here in those uh, boxes, so we can look at them. They have mouth parts, two mandibles uh, for crushing the food, and two maxilla for shredding the food, which you mentioned that this morning. Two uh, pair of antenna. You remember, uh, Chile Serrata did not have antenna. And the Griffith that finds a animal in his backyard, it have, if it has antenna, then it's probably uh, it's a crustacean. Well, we study other groups that have uh, uh, antenna too, but uh, right, these guys, uh, uh, they have antenna. <coughs> sensory, the antenna uh, for sensory, masticatory, uh, uh, the uh, uh, mandibles, and then for food handling is the maxilla. Okay, so those are the three functions I mentioned for three different parts. So the antenna for sensory, and masticatory is for mandible, and for food handling, and so on and so forth, is uh, for uh, maxilla. Uh, cephalothorax, yes, some of the species have cephalo, some of the species have uh, uh, cephalothorax, uh, not all, uh, but they do, some of the species have cephalothorax. Thorax and ab abdominal appendages for swimming or walking, First pair of walking leg is called a chilliped and bear chilla, and I'll show you a picture of it, uh, just like the uh, specimens we have. Um, oh, where are you? And then we do have uh, Fabian. You wanted Fabian wanted this early in the morning, but I was nice and warm and cozy in my spot over there, so I didn't bring it. So that's a trilobita. But this is, if you would, this whole entire thing right here, which if you go to Red Lobster, they put a, uh, a rubber band around here so they cannot open it. Uh, the whole entire thing is called chilliped, but this last segment right here, from here to here, is called chilla. I know you see it some pictures. You will see it in a minute. Okay. But uh, functions, uh, they are grasping food, uh, predation, defense. They defend themselves. They, uh, they, as a, uh, uh, they do uh, predation and food grabbing. Swimbreds, I'll show you some pictures and we'll talk about swimbreds on this model. You do not have swimbreds. Uh, they do not have it in here, uh, but uh, you'll see it uh, for swimming and or reproduction. Uh, the first pair of swimbreds is used for reproduction. And I'll show you some pictures. Uh, hopefully we'll talk about that. The appendages are uh, branched uh, by ramus. Okay, 
So what I mean, if you look at this model right here, this is an appendage, and there's at the end, you see it's French, just like uh, your Neris Vernus. You remember I, the, that the first time I threw the term biramus to you was in Neris Vernus. So the perpodia was, uh, you just are fresh from that exam. Uh, uh, so this is biramus. This appendage, this appendage at the end of it is biramus. They're not showing it in the other ones. But anyhow, uh, that's what uh, these, they're talking about. The appendage, we're talking about, uh, this is an appendage. Okay, this is an appendage, this is an appendage. And you saw it in, um, um, we saw it in Neris Fernis. Uh, rosterum is right there in the anterior end. You will see that telson and posterior end and uropods. These two, these guys are helping the animal all right here. It was a lab practical question. These two are uropod, and this is telson, and this is two uropod. Okay, so these are uh, helping uh, with swimming the animal uh, in, the, in the water. Carapace, you already talked about that. Tergum, you already talked about that. Sternum, you all know sternum is on the ventral side of the animal. Tergum is on the dorsal side of the animal. So these plates, these exoskeleton plates are called the tergum. These exoskeleton plates here are called sternum or sterna, I should say, plural, sterna, plural, sternum, singular, and uh, coelom is around the excretory or organs and gonads. Uh, muscles are striated, flexor uh, muscles draw uh, animal towards the body. So you have two sets of muscles here, extensor muscles and uh, extensor muscles and flexor muscles. So what am I saying? The extensor muscles uh, draw this, this abdomen toward the animal and the extensor muscles extend them and that aids the animal in swimming in the water. That's why they work antagonistically. And I, uh, I'll show you PowerPoints and I wrote it down. Uh, that's what it means. They work opposite. Antagonistically means they work opposite of each other. Open circulatory system, of course. That's true about uh, most all members of uh, arthropoda. These guys are arthropods, so they have open circulatory system. And blood is hemolymph. Uh, the largest class is class Malacostorico. So most of the species we have in the lab, guys, most of the species we have in the lab belongs to class Malacostorica. Okay, so here they are. Uh, and most of the species. Let's go. Uh, Asticus asticus, this is a scientific name for crayfish. Uh, so we do have crayfish in the lab. If you guys want to dissect, okay, you can look at the part. Uh, gills are like a feather. And we do have specimen here, we have models, I'm sorry. We have models in here, you can look at it and you see the uh, gills look like feather. Okay, Brandon, are you with me? Uh, large chilipid uh, for offense, defense, and food catching and handling and hemocyanin. It means their blood has uh, copper, that's why they call it hemocyanin. We human iron, we have iron in our blood, in our red blood cells, I'm talking red blood cells. So we call them hemoglobin. These guys have copper in the red blood cells. That's what they call it, hemocyanin. Okay. And then, of course, stomach has cardiac chambers, pyloric chambers, so on. A cornea of the eye divided into facets. It's a hexagon type of facets, two compound eyes, two antenna and two antennules. The smaller, we, on this model, on this model, we do not have, it was broken, if you look at it, the antenna and antennial was there at one day, but they are not here anymore. So, but they do have antenna. When you look at this model, don't think it was a toy, I guess somebody brought it, uh, inherited. Um, so don't think they do not have antenna. They do have antenna. They were, over the years, uh, was broken. But anyhow, uh, they have uh, two uh, antenna and two antennials. L-E-S in biology, or E-L, or L-E, something like that. At the end of the word in biology, most of the time it means small. One example you are familiar with, we already talked about canaliculi, okay, little canals in the bone. Remember that from beginning material. Uh, anyhow, uh, statocyst, uh, sacs, they contain statolith. In your ear, you have little stones called statolith. What do you guys think that is for? If you took anatomy or 
uh, maybe physiology or the anatomy, physiology combined. What do you think those little stones in our ear for? Huh? Our balance. They aid us with our balance. So these guys, they have in a status cyst sac, there's a sac and uh, hopefully inside, right next to the brain, right here, inside of the, inside of the animal, right here. So they have little stones in there and uh, they aid the animal with the balance while they are swimming in the water, as far as the nervous system goes. Okay, that's related to the nervous system. Green gland is a structure that is part of the excretory system. And um, it's actually green when you dissect the animal. Well, the fresh animal, you dissect them, you see them green. But the animals we have in the lab, you're dissecting them, you see them creamish color. Because, because the, the preservative they put the animals we have in the lab, you're dissecting them. Or other drama they have, they turn green, uh, they turn uh, creamish. But the models we have in the lab uh, that shows uh, internal structure of crayfish, they're all shown as green. Okay, so uh, uh, first pair of walking legs is chilapet. I'm already emphasizing that a lot. Okay, this is the gross anatomy of most members of this class. Okay, so in the back you have two uropod and one telson, as I showed you here, and these are the abdomen, there are six segments of the abdomen, and then these are the swim rats that I was talking about. Okay, these are the swim rats. And then you have your cephalothorax right here, which is covered by the exoskeleton carapace, and then you have these are on the back of the animal called tergum, on the uh, in, inside is called sternum. You remember that, okay? And then these are your walking legs right here. The very first one is chilla. That this segment from here is chilla, and then the an entire thing, all of this is called chilla pit. The first leg, and then these are called the walking leg. The remaining of walking legs, and then of course you have mandible. Uh, you have maxilla. I don't expect you to know these uh, on the specimens we have, on the models we have. Not only this one, there are other models. I don't expect you to know these, but uh, I expect you to know chilaped, chila. You can see them walking legs and swim red, uh, a uropod abdomen, uh, but not the mouth part right here. Okay, and then you have your rosterum right here, nice and beautiful, compound eye, and heniol right here, and antenna. This is your antenna, and these are your antennas. And what else? Uh, cephalothorax, uh, carapace, I'm going to over everything. So you should be able to, uh, on the models we have, everything else, uh, distinguish everything except these two guys. Okay? Let's go. And here is the internal structure of the animal. I, I'm not going to go over the external parts, chila pet chila, uh, antenna, antenna, compound eye, rosterum. Here is your stomach, and different parts of stomach was not mentioned in here. Oh, another name for uh, green gland, another name for green gland, green gland, another name for it, which is part of excretory system to get rid of the uh, waste, just like your uh, urinary system, equivalent to urinary system. This is part of excretory system. It's called antennal gland. Antennal gland is another name for green gland. Okay. And then you have the mouth on this part, you have stomach, and then you go toward the vast difference. These are all part of the um, reproductive tract. Then you have your heart. Around the heart, you have pericardium, just like us, we human. Around our heart, we have a sac called pericardium sac. And then osteum, do not worry about any of these. Testes, I'm not worried about it. Intestine ends up in anus. And these are your flexor extensor muscles right here. That's what you go to uh, red lobster, that's what you eat, these muscles. And then the very first swim red, the very, these are all swim red, and you can look at biramus. You see they are biramus. The very first swim red is for reproduction. The male transfer sperm to the female through the very first swim red. Okay? And there is a picture in your textbook. I don't know I have it here or not. I updated them and changed a lot of things. 
here. And there is a picture you can tell, even these animals we have here, you want to dissect. We have, you can, you, you can look at them and see the male and female. The male swimmerets is straight and the female swimmerets is kind of branched. Okay, the very first swimmerets. So uh, you can look at those and identify. What else do you have? Digestive glands, do not worry about it too much. Uh, here is a cross section of it, and that's what I meant. The uh, uh, gill looked like a feather. Okay? That's what the gills of these animals in the last picture they did not have. Did we have gill? No. They didn't show gill. The gill, it would be covering up most of these structures. After you move, you, you, move, you remove, after you remove, if you're dissecting this, you remove the carapace. After you remove it, you will see the gills. You see the gills, the feather-like gills on both sides. Okay, am I making some sense a little bit? And then, of course, we have models that show it to you. You, you want to dissect, we have them. You can dissect and find a model. Okay, so then you have underneath of the gills, then you have the visceral structures and stomach, gut, gonads, every pericardium around the heart, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's pretty much why the reason I put this model because of the gills in here. Uh, Mount Costa Rica, largest and most diverse class of crustacea uh, with more than 20,000 species. Do not worry about that number. Order isos, uh, Isopoda. Uh, one of the few truly terrestrial crustaceans. Not all crustaceans are aquatic. That's why I put that in there. You know, uh, roly poly. You guys know what that is. You played with it when you were a kid. Nicole, did you play with the roly poly? Yeah, yeah she played with the roly poly uh, when you were a kid. That's a crustacean. And they are not in land. But they do need wet environment. I don't know. You might go ahead and, add, and say, Amir, I found this in the internet that there are there, this is a crustacean found in desert. I don't know any crustacean that is in desert, right? Roly-poly needs a moist environment. I hope I'm making some sense. So most all crustaceans that I know in my life, that they do need moist, if they are not in water, of course, they do need a moist environment. Okay, so that's why truly terrestrial crustaceans that also have marine and freshwater forms. Uh, those of them are flatted, like carapace, they are talking about these guys, the isopoda. They're talking about isopoda, not the isopoda order within the class Malacosta Rica. Okay, and the first pair of thoracic limbs are maxillipid, while the remaining thoracic limbs are uh, exopids. Again, I'm not too worried about that information right here, but I just want you to know the, uh, some of the members of crustaceans are uh, terrestrial, not uh, they're all aquatic. Okay, uh, brief survey of crustaceans. Uh, common land forms include uh, soul bugs. Here we go, he's giving you more species. Soul bugs, pill bugs, that's what the roly polies are. The name for uh, pill bug, uh, roly polies, uh, you're familiar with roly polies, but that's what these are. That live under uh, stones and uh, damp uh, spaces, even terrestrial. Uh, the isopod the cuticle lacks effective uh, protections of insects cuticle, yes, they do not have that uh, moist habitat. Some isopods are highly diverse and parasites of fishes and crustaceans will grow in large sizes and uh, so on and so forth. Here is a roly poly that we were talking about. Pill bugs, of course, they're talking about pill bugs in here uh, that I thought I'd share. Uh, there is a, uh, some of these things, uh, form and function, hemocele, hemo, as you know, it means blood, seal, it means space. This is a blood, major space in arthropods in general that came from uh, persistent blastocele. You remember that term, right? Blastocele from beginning of semester, which is filled with blood, and that's what they call it, hemocele. Okay, so the spaces that came from blastocele, they are celomic spaces, if you would, and those spaces are filled with blood. That's what they call them, hemocele, okay? Celomic compartments, on top of those spaces that they have seal, they have celomic compartment. The first organism you saw that, it was in uh, leeches, right? Celomic compartment in leeches. You remember the first animals, you saw that in 
was in leeches. So they do have, and after that you saw it in, in mollusks, and then now you're talking about arthropods. Uh, in annelids it was different. They were had it all along the animal, the coelom, okay? But these guys, uh, the rest of the annelids, except leeches. Uh, but coelomic compartments remain um, as end sacs of excretory organs and spaces around the gonads. So excretory organs and gonads, uh, they have uh, they have the coelomic compartments. Muscles, I already gave you that term. Uh, I talked about it. The only thing that I want to give you is uh, uh, antagonistic. Uh, the, the most muscles are arranged, and here we go, antagonistic groups with flexor drawn limbs toward the body and extensive straighten up the animals, abdominal flexors and crayfish allow to swim backward uh, and escape the predators as well. So that's pretty much, that's because of this whole, uh, you know everything in here except that term, I thought I'd put it down so you know what that is. Some of the crustaceans, isopoda, we already talked about some of them. Testerial, yes, some have marine and fresh water, wood lice, pill bugs, uh, snow bug, sorry about that, it's not snow bug, it's snow bug, S O W Y. And no carpace, these guys do not have carpace, already summarizing everything. They have sessile compound eyes, uh, gills, some of them. Uh, copepod, you remember this? Uh, this is another uh, group of, uh, uh, of crustaceans. Copepod, you remember we talked about this guy? Trochonculus medinensis, you remember that? It's a worm that comes from uh, from the leg or arms, right here, Cyclops. Cyclops is the name of the genus that uh, we human drink in contaminated water. We drink it and then uh, we get the worms. You're, you know about this one, this is a nematode. You remember that, we talked about this. Copod is the host of guinea worm, the common name guinea worms. Uh, no compound eye, major food for whales and fishes, some are ectoparasites, barnacles uh, can be parasitic, uh, of course, to whales, uh, damage ships and speeding boats. Um, nowadays, the ships and speeding boats are uh, made up of fiberglass, they usually don't own damage and that might, but still they attach them. They use some kind of material, they do not uh, attach them. Daphnia, we do have slide of Daphnia, the water flea in the lab. So that's one of the, uh, I think this is the only crustacean slide we have in the lab. Okay. The only crustacean we have in the lab, which is water flea, and died for many uh, fishes and whales, young in brood chamber underneath of the carapace. And this is the life cycle of, you probably have seen this, uh, uh, life cycle of Trochonculus medinensis. Do you remember that one? So we human drink these uh, cyclops. These are cyclops we drink. And then it's a copepod, it's a type of copepod. Cyclops is the name of the genus copepod. And then here are your uh, barnacles in general. For a long time, they thought barnacles are uh, mollusks. And then just recently, uh, they moved them to uh, a phylum arthropodum. So they are not mollusks. Uh, that's what they thought because uh, they have this um, outer shell. Because of that shell, they thought they are mollusks, but they are not. But barnacles are monaceous. Most arthropods are uh, dioecious. You have male and female. Most all arthropods. Here are a good example that they are monaceous. So barnacles, most of them are monaceous, but uh, they practice cross fertilization, and of course, some of them are. Uh, they do parthenogenesis. Okay, so you know everything about these guys. Do not worry about any of these structures. Do not worry about it. Again, uh, these are some of the uh, inside structure of the barnacles. Your textbook does not have it, so I thought I'd put it in. I thought it's nothing you have to worry about. Here is a whale, head of a whale, uh, that has these uh, barnacles attached there. Of course, they're parasitic, uh, they attach to them, and yeah, that's what you have in your textbook. Okay. <clears throat> it's a gray whale. Yeah, right. I'm done with crustaceans. Let's go to hexapod. Last. Oh no, we have myrophod. I was going to say last half mile. No, mm -hmm. that's not true. So hexapod, you guys. Uh, if you look at this pie, let's look at this pie chart together. Are you guys ready? This is 
This is, you guys, this is all of the animal kingdom. All of the animals on planet Earth are this one. Are you with me so far? Now, the blue part are insects. Uh, we are talking different number of species. I'm not talking about uh, how many housefly is found in your home. I'm not talking about that. Housefly is just one species. Am I making some sense? And mosquito is another species. Butterfly is another species. We have different type of butterfly. Okay, so this is, if this was a pie, if you would, this are all insects. And then these would be your other arthropods, all of the crustaceans and everything else we study. <clears throat> this would be all of your <clears throat> jellyfish, earthworm, you remember that? All other invertebrates. This is it. You guys see that? And then you have your protozoans, that's much. And then this much, that's why we do not emphasize in this class, we do not emphasize on chordate animals. I'm not even, I'm not even mentioning vertebrates, chordate animals, because you see the, um, right here, um, uh, it's, a, it's a chordate animal. Well, you'll see it, I will talk about chordate animals. That's why we don't talk about, I don't talk about chordates. Because look at the animal kingdom, all of it, most of it are invertebrates. And I'm uh, excluding protozoa. I'm excluding protozoa. These are all, all are invertebrates or well, non, non chordates. Okay, so the size of animal kingdom. And, um, of course, <coughs> these are the dominant force. Well, your textbook argues with me. These are like dinosaurs, they are dominant force on, on Earth right now. But these guys, uh, your textbook says, and I agree with your textbook, uh, that these guys are uh, the dominant. Anyhow, let's move I, I think I emphasize on it. Subphylum, hexapoda, class insecta, they're in, that, in, the, in this subphylum, there are two classes, and I give you the name of the other class, which you do not have to worry about it. But the class insecta, uh, the study of insects is called uh, entomology. If you go to big universities, they have plant uh, entomology, and they have medical entomology. Medical entomology means are insects that they cause diseases. Am I making some sense? And then plant entomology means uh, uh, insects that they cause diseases to the plants. You know, they're, uh, they're plants pests. Anyhow, you have it in big universities. Uh, hexapoda are named for the presence of six legs. Right? That's what you mentioned this morning. And they're all uniranians. It means these appendages right here, you see this is by Ramus, right? It means their appendages is one. It's not branched. It's just one, like that. Okay, so that's what it means their appendages are like. Uh, they're not by Ramus, they're uniranians. Uh, the, before this a new edition of your textbook, uh, the name of this subphylum was Uniranians. <coughs> Uniranians. If you see it in your test or quizzes, I'm sorry about that. Change it. It means uh, uh, it means uh, hexapoda. Two classes uh, with hexapoda entognatha, which is small group with uh, bases of mouth parts enclosed within the head capsules. We do not have any specimen of this in the lab. But these are the most uh, largest one in uh, insecta, enormous class with, uh, 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 with that have like not the mouth part, but base of the mouth part is outside the head of the capsule. Yes, sir. Well, can you update the slide? Can I what? Update the slide. Yes, I will do them for you. Thank I just want your attention now. That's yeah. why. You know, I, knew, I knew Glenn is going to ask me that. Is that right, Glenn? <laughs> Brandon, when you come back to visit, you will say I'm Brandon, I hope. Thank you. Still, some people come back and visit and they don't say anything. Oh, no. They don't say anything. Say, hi, Amir. How are you? Say, hi, how are you? <laughs> okay. Infestation, infection. They, these animals, you will see. Uh, I give, is that mine? Uh, some of these animals, they are. Um, yes, sorry. Okay. Some of these animals, they do cause uh, infection. Uh, but what does it mean? 
they go from outside to the inside like a, we have horse pocket. Horse pocket doesn't seem to be bothering horses, but most horses have them. Okay, most horses in the United States, we're talking about the United States, have them. They go to the stomach and then uh, the larval stages comes out from poop. So, but we have other animals that they go inside of uh, the digestive tract and then they end up in the back of the animal. They put a big hole in the back of the animal. I still do not have any pictures, but I will uh, uh, talk about it in a minute. But anyhow, uh, so they cause infestation like ticks, okay? They are, um, we have um, uh, eye fly, uh, we have other animals, uh, horse fly, that they are causing animals infestation. Uh, tick, as you know, it's not a, uh, it's not a, uh, a hexapoda, a tick is a chilicerata, but anyhow, uh, some, uh, some cause infestation and some cause infection. As we go along, you will see it. Most parasitic arthropods are similar in free living uh, relatives, different behavior, uh, uh, physiology, and mode of life. Largest class, mass in every habitat except ocean. Okay, so arthropods, you can, uh, hexapoda, you can find them anywhere in the jungles, in deserts, in the soil, but except the sea. You cannot see much of the um, hexapoda in the sea. Okay. Mandibles, mouth parts, chewing, sucking, uh, sponging, those are my head, thorax, abdomen, two eyes, and usually three simple eyes. Thorax has three parts, and uh, either with two wings or four wings attached to it. Prothorax, mesothorax, and metathorax. These are parts of the thorax that have uh, wings attached to it. Uh, thorax uh, also contain the legs, usually has six legs and uh, direct or indirect flight muscles. I need to talk about that, I'll try it on the board, but hang on. Eptrigota, it means uh, the, uh, the uh, insecta that they do not have a wing. Eptrigota, it means without wing. These are the animals, the wingless uh, insects. There are two orders of them, little of any metamorphosis. Example, spring tails or snow fleas, uh, silverfish, these are all examples. Terigota, P is silent, P is silent, Terigota, it means these are the insects that they have wings. Have wings uh, or lost them, uh, 22 orders, uh, different uh, degree, uh, degrees uh, of metamorphosis. Uh, Exoptrigota, it means uh, they, uh, they are the hemimetabolus, example, egg, nymph, adult. Hemi, it means almost uh, metabolus, it means metamorphosis. That's what it means they have almost complete metamorphosis, which is not complete metamorphosis. A means adult. Uh, we do have some examples in incomplete metamorphosis. I'll talk about that. Wings form during final mold. And end of trigota, they have holo, it means complete. At the beginning of semester, you, uh, uh, when you were talking about embryology, there was a holo, do you remember that? What was that? Holoplastic. Holoplastic and meroplastic, do you remember that? Holo, it means the whole entire egg divides. And then this is holometabolus, it means you have the complete metamorphosis, egg, larva, pupa, adult. Okay, that's pretty much. Uh, then uh, wings forms during uh, pupation, pupa, that's what it means. And then complete metamorphosis. Different types of, uh, other types of metamorphosis, I should say, uh, A metabolus, uh, eggs, young, adult, uh, example, horseshoe crab, spiders, crayfish, uh, centipedes, silverfish, and then what else? Uh, a heavy metabolus, um, which is incomplete metamorphosis, egg, nymph, adult, I think I talked grasshopper, I'm giving you examples now. Uh, and then holometabolus, complete metamorphosis, egg, larva, pupa, uh, bees, butterflies, beetles, flies. We do have this in the lab. We have the egg larva, pupa, adult uh, in the lab. That would be your fruit fly. We have an example of fruit fly in the lab. Nymph, by definition, nymph is an immature stage in the morphological, similar to adult in hemimetabolus. That's what nymph is. 
But pupa, larva stage, before the adult stage in whole metabolism insects, not necessarily look like adult. That's the difference between uh, nymph and pupa. Here it is. Uh, you remember I talked about indirect. Do not worry about the bottom one. I will talk about the bottom picture in a minute. Hang on. Just let's focus on the top picture. The way that uh, the wings of most advanced um, uh, insects that they fly, this is how their wings, this is how it works. They have these uh, vertical muscles and they have longitudinal muscles. When the vertical muscles are contracting, the wings goes up, and then when the um, longitudinal muscles contract, the wings comes down. This is your, this would be your, uh, uh, your sternum, that would be your pterygium, sternum, pterygium, this is a cross section of the animal, and these are the flight muscles, okay? The way these are muscles are attached, the way they are attached, they are attached to uh, pterygium and sternum, they are not directly attached to wings. When the, the wings are like this, this is a wing, this is a wing, and when the muscles attach directly to the wings, that's called direct flight muscles. This is indirect flight muscles. This is more advanced. This is more advanced when we talk about evolution and so on and so forth, than this guys. These guys are more primitive, and as time went on, they attached to the flight muscles, to the abdomen, and to the, um, to the um, pterygium and sternum. I hope I'm making some sense. Okay, yes, baby. Are there direct flight muscles in arthropods? Yeah, yeah, there still they are. There's still some arthropods that they have uh, the direct flight muscles. Okay, so worm-like larva, caterpillar, butterfly, so uh, these are some examples. Life cycle, they molt, as you know, uh, when molt to molt to molt, then in between the molting, it's called stage or install. Okay, that's what the, when the animal is between the molts, it's called stage or install. I think stage is a bad term. Uh, it can be confusing, but in store, that's the term I like to use. The stages between the modes. Osmoregulations, impermeable in, in, uh, in, integuments, malpigian tubules, we talked about it. What is the function of malpigian tubules? Uh, usually, um, uh, crustaceans do not have malpigian tubules, okay? Uh, most of them, they absorb ions, uh, potassium for a hemolymph. And then a rectal pads absorbs water and rectum and return it to the hemolymph. Uh, respiration, uh, oxygen directly from the air, uh, spiracles open to trachea, and then uh, why spiracles have valves? Because if you look at grasshopper, a model of the control. Here is a model of grasshopper, and each one of these dots. Each one of these dots on this model is called spherical. And then they're showing it inside the spherical, so the black dot right here. And this is the lungs or trachea, uh, whatever you want to call it. Different textbooks call it different things, either lung or trachea. However, these spherical, they have a valve in front of them. And I'm asking the question, why these Spherical's have a valve in front of them, and then when they want to inspire, the valve opens up, the air goes in, and that's not the case in um, the spherical's in um, spider. Okay, why? Like um, uh, grasshopper has spherical's have valves, while uh, and in spiders they do not have valves. You all know what I mean? Valves are like operculum. You're probably familiar with the term operculum. But they don't call them operculum, they call them valves. Why do they have, what do you think these guys have valves in this period? Because grasshoppers fly? Why? No, you're not giving me a direct answer, you're giving me an indirect And When they fly, they're exposed to what? No. They're exposed to what? When they're flying? Wind? And what, what is in the wind? Particles? Huh? What particles? Bacteria, dust, um, 
what else? Parasites, so on and so forth. That's why they have bowels. We have, if you want to compare that to us, we inhale bacteria from, we inhale dust, but what does, how do we get rid of it? You remember from first, second exam material? In our trachea, we have cilia, which pushes these junk up into our throat. Right, do I make sense? So we do have a system to protect ourselves from all of the dust and junk in the air. They do have a system to protect themselves from the junk and uh, trash in the air. Trachea branch to uh, tracheals, and then uh, what is the difference between trachea of spiders and insects? The trachea of spiders do not branch, but uh, the insects trachea can branch. That's the main difference. Aquatic insects have gills, of course. Here is the egg you saw it at the beginning of uh, semester: egg, larva, pupa, and then finally the adult, the beetle. Uh, this is your holometabolism, complete metamorphosis. Here is a picture of some of these guys. The only thing that I want to mention in here is the setae on the surface of the animals. They are very sensitive to air current, to anything. When you want to catch a fly, it's not that easy. Is that right? You have to work for it. It's because of their uh, these setae, they can detect the air currents. Order Hymenoptera, which we'll talk about it later. Uh, what adaptations uh, do insects have for weather changes during winter time? And that's one of the reasons uh, scientists are concerned about global warming because if we do not have harsh winters, what happens, the arthropods do not die. They're supposed to die in winter time, so the population does not rise constantly. That's one of the, one of the concerns they have, some arthropods. Some arthropods, they die in winter time, the population goes down. So in the spring and summer, they come back again. But that's one of them, so anyhow. Uh, some die after releasing eggs, of course. Uh, diapods it can happen in any stage. Uh, example, egg, larva, pupa, or adult. Diapods, it means um, the, uh, the animal goes into hibernation. That's the wrong term to use, uh, but they do not, uh, are not met uh, metabolically active. That's what I mean by diapods. And then partial endothermy, it means portion of the animals undergo uh, slow metabolism, uh, like the abdomen, the, uh, the gonads, they can go under low metabolism during harsh times of the year. Pile, it means some animals, they form uh, deposits of glycogen, fat, for winter time, when there's not enough food. So uh, that's what happens in some species, okay? <clears throat> Sensory organs and nervous system, mechanoreceptors, you all know this, but uh, you all know about this one. Mechanically, when the animal is mechanically uh, stimulated, chemoreceptors, chemical uh, stimuli, uh, pheromone, uh, we never talked about this in, uh, so far, but it is a good time to stop and talk about pheromone, the importance of pheromone in animal kingdom. In animal kingdom, pheromone is a two way to detect the opposite sex, usually, usually females, in most cases, females release pheromone and the male can detect them by a sense of smell from a distance. And the best study example of pheromone is in dogs. The female dog release pheromone during breeding season and the male dogs can detect it from miles away. Okay, so the same thing that happens in arthropods. Uh, you might ask in the small intestine, you remember we talked about hookworms, we have male and female hookworms in the small intestine, there are studies that they looked at hookworms pheromone level, that the female released pheromone in the small intestine, and the male hookworm go find uh, the female and they copulate, as you know the rest of the story we talked about hookworms. But that is uh, also, that's, uh, that uh, the importance of pheromone in arthropods is uh, significant to the uh, study them in few species. 
Compounds are hexagonal, uh, not rectangular, uh, facets like crustaceans. Uh, uh, antenna is part of the central nervous system. No flying control and center, no pathway. So far, scientists cannot figure out rim that where the uh, uh, how these animals control their flight. We don't know. Still, we don't know. Uh, in birds, it's a little bit different. They do have some ideas, but in arthropods that are flying, like the house fly, we don't know how they're flying. There is no control center, if you will, part of that relate that to the nervous system or any other system. They cannot relate it. Digestive system: a pair of mandibles, jaw, the hypopharynx. We do have a grasshopper mouth part, guys. <coughs> slide of it, slide of grasshopper mouth parts. Make sure you find all of these on your slides, on the slide of grasshopper mouth part. So we do have uh, hypopharynx, labrum, it's the upper lip, and labium is the lower lip. Uh, then not, you will not see full gut, hind gut, mid gut. Uh, these are different parts of the digestive system. Full gut it has crop and gizzard for uh, digestion, if you would. Uh, they, you all know what digestion means. It means breaking down food, right? So that's pretty much what uh, a mid gut, a cecal stomach. Uh, there is more digestion in this area, and then finally hind gut, intestine and rectum, which is for absorption. Okay, so uh, fore gut, mid gut is used for, uh, of course, crop gizzard, cecal stomach. <coughs> These are parts that are used for. Um, uh, digestion, and you all know what digestion means, breaking down food. And absorption, it means when food is absorbed into the blood vessels. Okay, and that happens in the intestine and the rectum for um, water. Many ants and termites cultivate fungi in their burrows, so they are the first farmers, not us human. These animals know how to farm. Uh, some species know how to farm, and they grow fungi for Purposes. Reproduction and behavior, fertilization, internal, over all, all of these you can, uh, can be found in arthropods. All of them, uh, over by first, uh, in uh, insecta. And eosociality means they have a system of labor, queen, you all know this. In case of honeybees, you know about honeybees, you know about termites, they have a queen, and so on and so forth. Other uh, orders, uh, Orthoptera, so for this exam, I'm hoping you would know this, you know, I will give you a rundown here in a minute, but you would know I will give you an arthropod, uh, an insecto before you, and you would tell what order it belongs to, okay? So some of the orders for lab practical purposes, and start working on them from now. They're all in there, they're all in the displays we have, and it's not that difficult. <coughs> Cockroach, uh, order Orthoptera, cockroaches, grasshopper, crickets, uh, mantids, they're all uh, in that order. Uh, uh, or order with the cockroach is a questionable one, and uh, here it's cockroach. Cockroaches, and some people put it in uh, Dictyoptera uh, or uh, Valeteria, so I don't know. I'll probably never put cockroach in the lab practical exam. But anyhow, if nothing else, it can be in the Orthoptera, order Orthoptera. Um, head, thorax, abdomen, of course, two compound eyes, mandibles, nothing new, maxilla posterior to mandibles, uh, veins in the wings, uh, three ocelli, two jointed antenna, uh, prothorax, mesothorax, metathorax, segments of legs, coxa, trochanter, femur. I've got to show this on a picture to you guys. These are the parts I'm hoping you would know the leg parts for the lab practical purposes. Okay, so on this model, of the grasshopper. You do not see it, uh, but we have another model which you can see it and the picture will come up. <coughs> Spherical, already talked about that. Sensory cerci, here is a comparing of animals. Um, do I have a better picture? I guess not, maybe. So here's a mouth part. These are the parts of the legs. The biggest one right here is a femur right here, and then this is tibia, and these are your tarsals. And then a trochanter and coxa should be these two. This is a big, huge femur right here, and this is tarsa, and these are your uh, uh, tibia, I'm sorry. This is your tibia, sorry, this is a femur, 
tibia and these are your torso. And then you have your uh, uh, trochanter and coxal.